I'm the, I'm the chief executive of a company called Active Energy Group PLC. Um, we're really excited to show you our select group of guests. Lots of people wanted to come, we couldn't accommodate them, and we chose the people who we felt would have the most immediate benefit from seeing what we're doing, particularly those from Utah. Uh, we've got some guests who come from as far as New Zealand today, um, and the United Kingdom, uh, which is where we're based, obviously, in our corporate headquarters, although most of our exciting activity happens in this little building and in this yard here. Um, we're really happy to see Rocky Mountain Power. Thank you for coming. Uh, we've got the Forestry Service, State Forestry Service, which is really important. Um, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot with them in the near future. Uh, we've got Young Living Farms with us today. They've been looking at us and working with us for two years? Two years. And um, one of the things I'm going to say right now is, when you see the plant operating, it's been set up not to provide a coal plant for the first four to six weeks, it's going to be providing another product to Young Living. Um, what people don't know is that what, one of the, one, without doing certain other processes, we produce a very exciting soil amendment. Um, and it's also a great environmental process for Young Living who produce a lot of biomass material in their process, which happens to be ideal as an input to what we call coal switch. And there's a big truck out there, which Mark said he's going to let me have. <laughs> it's made in American truck as well, it's a proper one. And it's got a 48 foot trailer, and I understand there's going to be a number of them going backwards and forwards from Young Living, bringing in their waste material to avoid environmental damage, making them uh, a completely clean business um, in their production cycle, and us processing their material and them taking it back and using it as a really great soil amendment, or you call it something quite a little bit different, I think, don't well, you? Compost and soil amendment. Yeah. Engineered, yeah, soil. engineered soil. Engineered soil. And the beauty of it is that for each different species, I suppose you'd call it, or of plant that they grow, and I think you're the world's biggest company in essential oils. Yes. Uh, they can engineer the soil, with the, 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 the product that we make with us, to put exactly the right nutrients on each type of plant to get the best yield for their company. So we'll be doing that going forward and we'll give you more news on that as, as things develop. But there's big plans with Young Living and have been for some time. Um, with Rocky Mountain, I'll give you any detail, they can talk to themselves, they're here. Um, but we're, we're just glad to see them and we've been talking with them this weekend for quite some time. And we appreciate everything you've done with us to help us go forward on the STEP program. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to hand it over to um, Phil Scalzo, who's uh, the one of the brains behind the operation. There's quite a lot of brains in here. I think he's very excited to tell you about what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the presentation. It's pretty, uh, it's, it's easy to understand. We were going to put it on the internet for people who couldn't come. There's a lot of people who asked, they wanted to see it. So we're going to film Phil doing it over the internet. We're not going to be filming you guys, don't worry. It's just, um, just sharing the information. We're very excited about this. We've, we've spent now ourselves three years supporting this business and building it with these guys but they've put a lot more in so they're 10 years into this pro this idea um, which is now more than that it's now a, a production process that's unique around the world my job is not really here it's out everywhere else um, I pretty much live in an aeroplane we have huge support for what we're doing we're very unique um, you'll hear all about it now you'll see it in a little while um, it's a fantastic technology. We're working with all kinds of industries, from agriculture through coal-fired power, um, into, into, um, uh, into and, and basically everything that is to do with turning environmental waste materials into an environmental benefit. So if I can hand over to Phil, and uh, he can tell you all about what we've been doing. Oh, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to be promoted to CEO uh, because he forgot to introduce Michael Rowland, the chairman. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just introduce Michael. Why don't you, you want to say a word or two? No, 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 you got all it. Right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is an exciting day for us, of course. Uh, something that we've been working toward for a really, really long time. Uh, it feels like centuries. Um, it's actually been uh, probably closer to uh, 10 years. Um, 
I am going to change the slide now. I hope you noticed the, the <coughs> Richard, Richard disagreed with the color of the font. Um, uh, but, you know, basically our, our claim to fame is that uh, we can produce a product um, with properties almost uh, identical to coal, but substantially cleaner, and we can do it in 30 minutes. Uh, something that nature takes millions of years to do, we figured out a way to accelerate that, uh, um, obviously quite significantly. Um, today's presentation, uh, it's a technical presentation. Um, I will do my best to kind of tell you what you're going to see when you go out to see the plan. It's obviously a little bit more difficult to uh, address a large group uh, while we're strolling around the construction site. Um, but it is uh, um, a fun thing to see, but it would be nice to know what you're looking at. And so that was the point of today's presentation. Um, we started in uh, really in earnest in October of 2000. 2013, uh, we've taken it out of the laboratory now and we're, we're starting to actually uh, produce material for testing. And so that's our first system. Uh, we were um, quite proud of that at the time. We're actually still kind of proud of it. It's going to go in the AEG Museum. Um, you know, uh, we're going to make a bust of Drew, our chief scientist, and uh, he'll be he'll be standing next to it. Uh, let me let me do that for a second. Let me introduce our our team. So as as I said, Dr. Carlton Drew Tate, we call him Drew. He is our chief science officer. Um, behind me over here, um, this is uh, Dan McCarthy, and he is our vice president of engineering. Jason Owens is our director of project management. Ron Sella, the, the real uh, moving force of our firm, is uh, our Vice President of Manufacturing. Um, Russ Taylor is our Vice President of Business Development for North America. Um, I don't see anybody else. They're all out there trying to get the silly thing to work, um, <laughs> which is a good thing, I think. That's kind of like why you're here. Um, so, Drew and I uh, started this. We actually started um, well before 2013, but it was more chemistry and physics and less um, actual uh, laboratory work. Here is the, uh, the first reactor. It was 1.5 liters. Um, you can see the screwdriver next to it for scale. Uh, that's our first reactor. Um, I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead two slides and I'm going to tell you that we're at now 4,500 liters. So we've done a bit of scaling over the last uh, few years. Our second system, uh, November of 2015, was 15 liters. Uh, May 2016, we graduated to 150 liters. We couldn't believe how much material we were making. It was fantastic, you know, 20, 25 kilograms per shot. We felt like we had... Uh, we had it licked. Um, importantly, what we found was that scaling was an issue. Um, one of the big concerns always when you're in the science game is you can get anything to happen in a test tube. The question is can you make it a commercial scale so that you could actually make money from it, uh, which is Richard's goal at least. I, I don't know what uh, uh, the rest of us, but certainly Richard's goal is to make money from this. and so. Uh, we have to be able to make it in tons and not in kilograms. So we graduated to the system that you're going to see today. Um, we have, in this, in this uh, deployment, we have four reactors. Each one of them is sized to 4,500 liters. So this system uh, is sized to 18,000 liters. Um, and it'll produce between five and seven and a half tons an hour. Um, the um, uh, material will very much determine the actual throughput. Uh, the five tons an hour, we describe this as a five ton an hour plant because we like to be conservative. The five ton an hour plant uh, was really uh, developed to process the absolute worst material we've ever seen, which is uh, empty fruit bunch from Malaysia. And uh, we don't have a lot of empty fruit bunches in uh, um, Utah. Uh, that comes from the oil palm tree, and we don't have a lot of oil palm trees, hence no empty fruit bunches. Uh, but when we're processing regular wood, like Young Living Farms Juniper, or Rocky Mountain Power's um, miscellaneous wood from the, the mountains of Utah, uh, we're closer to seven tons an hour. 
the um, system, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of an understanding of what actually happens in our process. Mm -hmm. And this gives me a little bit of an opportunity to kind of distinguish uh, our process from our competitors. What we do uh, is we take the material, and we'll take any material, as long as it's got a plant fiber, it works for our process. Um, we'll take the slash, the hog fuel, the bark, any of the, 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 you know, the treetops, the leaves, we'll take anything as a plant fiber and we'll process it through our system. Our competitors have to go um, with the very highest quality, cleanest material. They won't deal with the slash, they won't deal with the bark, they go right to the heartwood and then they, they go to trees that are um, especially uh, free from contaminants like chlorine and uh, potassium uh, all of the, the sodium, all of the things that uh, would create havoc in Rocky Mountain Power's uh, furnaces. They have to start with really clean material. That material is very expensive. Um, it's not uncommon to spend $50, $60 a ton to buy feedstock to make white pellets or the Zilka pellets or the Arbor Flame pellets. We're able to take material that some people will actually ta uh, pay us to take. Um, we've we've uh, sourced material where we can get it for $10 a ton, for $5 a ton. So we can get material very inexpensively. And the reason is because we wash it. Um, everyone else is quite averse to adding water into their process. In fact, they go to great lengths to remove water from their process. Uh, for example, the Zilka process will take uh, the material and dry it even before they put it into their reactors. Uh, what we do is we wash the heck out of it. Um, and you know, you'll see the process for doing that. But we're removing the majority of the surface uh, dirt, which, which becomes ash, uh, and we remove a, potentially up to 50% of the salts, even in that first wash. Uh, we'll then transfer the material into our reactor, uh, where um, now the material is obviously quite wet and soggy. Um, it'll be conveyed into the reactor where we will introduce uh, heat. Now there's already water and there's air in there, so there's already oxygen. Uh, with the addition of the heat, we initiate um, wet oxidation, so we're gonna start to degrade the lignin component of the plant fiber. The lignin is the glue that binds the, the fiber together. And so we'll start to degrade that. Now that's a phenolic compound, and Drew is gonna talk a little bit about that later, but by degrading the, the um, lignin, we're loosening the fiber. And so we're reducing the conditions that we need later on in our process when we explode the fiber uh, to expose the interstitial salts, the stuff that's on the inside of the fiber that just simply won't wash away. Uh, we're also initiating a process called weak acid hydrolysis. And that's very, very important, especially to our, our power plant friends. Um, inside of the, the hemicellulose of the fiber, that's where all of the light volatiles uh, reside and we're starting to dissolve away that hemicellulose. And we have very accurate control of how much hemicellulose we actually uh, dissolve away. We dissolve the right amount out, not all of it. And the first things that come out are the light volatiles. And the light volatiles have a very low ignition temperature. And so if you are operating a uh, conventional power plant, a pulverized coal plant, you're gonna run, wanna run your fuel through a mill. And if you run your fuel through a mill with those low ignition temperatures, there's a very high probability of having a mill fire. And I think I could speak for the, uh, the Rocky Mountain Power guys that mill fires are really no fun at all. Uh, you really don't want to have a, a fire before you actually get in your furnace. That's the preferred place. Um, so what we'll do is um, we'll w wash away, dissolve away, and then wash away those light volatiles. And like I said, we have pretty good control. We can take all of the hemicellulose out, but then we don't have quite the yield. So we're able to dial in the amount of hemicellulose to take out <coughs> to raise the ignition temperature of the material so that it can pass through the mill without, without uh, risk. After we've uh, given it sufficient residence time, and that's where these two chemical processes are occurring during that residence period, uh, we will very rapidly depressurize the reactor. And when I say very rapidly, we're gonna depressurize that reactor in less than a second, more like a half a second. And during that half a second, <coughs> um, the fibers inside of the, the reactor are going to explode like popcorn because the pressure is the same on the inside of the fiber and on the outside of the fiber. And when you reduce the pressure on the outside, the pressure <coughs> on the inside doesn't have enough time to work its way out 
gently, and so the fiber explodes, just like a piece of popcorn in a microwave. What that does is that exposes the um, inside <coughs> of the fiber. Um, when you expose the inside of the fiber, you're also exposing the interstitial salts, which are uh, very soluble. And so they'll go into solution when we take it out of the reactor and put it into the second wash. If, if someone were here from the white pellet space, I guess people are here from the white pellet space, um, they would recognize that the, you don't want to be introducing water, but we're, we're going to a ratio of one part solid to nine parts water in that uh, second wash so that we can dissolve away those salts. Well, that's the uh, 1015 from Phoenix. Uh, the, uh, either that or we're attacking North Korea. I'm not sure. So, uh, all right, that's good. So, um, <coughs> the, uh, we'll, we'll push the material out of the reactors and we'll dump it into a, um, a washing cycle again, removing those salts. But then we have to dewater that material. It's now um, very, very uh, soggy, a slurry, really. And so we need to dewater it. And so there's two ways to dewater something you could thermally dry it or you can mechanically extrude it. Uh, it takes about 190 BTUs per pound of water to mechanically extrude it, and 970, we'll call it 1,000 BTUs per pound of water to thermally remove it. And so obviously, from an energy standpoint, it's far better to mechanically extrude as much water as we can. So we'll take the moisture content of the material um, down to 35%, 38%. Uh, through the mechanical extrusion process. That saves us an enormous amount of money uh, in terms of the energy. Remember that the material coming in has got a moisture content of somewhere between 35 and as high as 50 percent. So we've basically removed all of the extra water we added and we've done it mechanically. Second wave. Um, so then after that we're going to move it into our dryers. Uh, now the dryers can <coughs> Dryers consume a, a considerable amount of energy as well, and so uh, we're very conscious of the energy balance. Um, I'm sure everyone uh, is wondering how much energy we're actually consuming in order to, to beneficiate, that's the term we use, our, our, our uh, material. Um, we're using about the same amount of energy um, that a Zilka would use. Uh, because we're, we're, we're dewatering the material mechanically, but then what we're doing is we're taking the, the flue gas, the hot flue gas from our boiler, and we're running that flue gas into the dryer. Now we have to supplement it um, because boilers cycle, and, and uh, when the, and it's on low fire, it's not producing enough heat, so we have a supplemental burner that kicks in to make up the, the heat so that we have a steady temperature in the dryer. So we'll remove the, uh, the extra um, water that way. So we're saving all of that energy, though, because we're using the, the flue gas, which would otherwise just go up into the environment. We're very, very conscious of, uh, of uh, BTUs. In my early career, I worked at an electric utility for about 15 years. And as a cub engineer, the first thing they have you do is chase BTUs around a power plant. Um, very, very conscious of something they call heat rate, which is how much energy it takes in order to make a kilowatt hour. I spent the first year of my life chasing BTUs, and so I uh, haven't quite lost that, uh, that focus. So here's our system, and I will uh, expect everyone to take a quiz on this as soon as, uh, as we're done. Um, I will not bore you with all of the details, just to say that you know, we've, we've engineered this so that it's a closed loop system. Um, it is a very, very closed loop system. You'll see if you study this, you're going to see that um, there's constant energy recovery, there's uh, constant water recovery, so that we're not putting any, uh, any money out of the plant except in the form of pellets um, or, or whatever the product is. Um, when we um, get into each of the systems, you'll, you'll have a sense for, for how we're doing that. But so here's our, uh, our plant. Um, this is the uh, bird's eye view. This is as high as Jason was willing to go um, before he cowered it out on us um, with the uh, man lift. 
he could have gone an extra 20 or 30 feet, but he, he just didn't have the, the courage to do that. Um, you're going to see this plant now uh, from a top view, um, just so I can kind of show you how, how material moves through the system. The uh, important part about this is that we have to think in terms of logistics. You know, trucks have to bring material in, and trucks have to bring product out, and it's got to be in a in a convenient fashion for them because there's a cost associated with that. And so what we do is we start, uh, lo we load material from a pile that's over here with, with a bucket loader or it can be with a conveyor. We then move the material out of the receipt hopper to that first washing system, the pre-wash system. Uh, after that, it'll go through a, a weigh belt so that we can meter the amount of material that's going into the reactors. Then it's distributed uh, across a, uh, a conveyor on top of the reactors to the specific reactor that's being filled at the time. Now we have four reactors and they're operating synchronously. We call a continuous batch. And so as one reactor is filling, another reactor is heating, another reactor is, is uh, cooking, and then another reactor is emptying. And so we're always moving material. So the cycle time on this plan is about seven and a half minutes. Uh, we have seven and a half minutes to load the reactor, half an hour inside the reactor, seven and a half minutes to empty the reactor. We obviously do it much quicker than that, but that's the, the idea. We need to um, move the material through the process um, quickly, and so we've operated these reactors synchronously to take advantage of the, of the, um, the four reactors, four reactor system. Coming out of the reactors, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I forgot that we actually have to cook it. We're going to run some heat from the boiler, steam, high pressure steam. That'll be anywhere from 350 PSI up to as much as 450 PSI, 475 PSI. It depends on the feedstock. A, a hardwood has a lower lignin content. It's counterintuitive, but that's the case. A lower lignin content, and so it requires substantially less energy than a softwood does. Um, so when we ran, for example, the Métis um, uh, poplar, um, also, uh, um, you know, a hardwood, um, we were able to uh, run it at 400 PSI, 385 PSI. Um, when we've run uh, the pine and the, you know, the softwoods, the fir, it took a little bit more energy, so we were closer to that 450, 475. Um, when we um, uh, decide that it's had enough residence time, we will uh, rapidly depressurize those reactors. There's a valve that we developed that will, with a, with a, a valve manufacturer, will we'll, uh, um, open that valve very, very quickly. It's a 12-inch valve that opens up in less than a, about a quarter of a second. So it's a pretty quick valve. Uh, the steam will come rushing out, go through a, uh, we call it a gas expansion vessel, a GEV. It's actually a, really a cyclone where the steam has a chance to expand, water droplets have a chance to drop out along with any microparticles that got carried with the steam. Um, the steam then goes back to our receipt hopper where we um, preheat the material and so we're conserving those BTUs. And um, some of you may have seen Richard's uh, online video of the, uh, the, um, the discharge of our reactor back on December 29th where we actually wanted to see the valves open and so we exhausted the atmosphere. It's, it was quite a lot of energy that came out of that reactor. Um, we, uh, we sprayed probably, I don't know, 100 or so feet. I mean, pretty, pretty vigorous uh, um, release of energy. So we want to capture that energy, and so we direct it back to the material to preheat it. So we've saved that energy. We've also saved the water. Um, after the detonation, that's probably not the right word, after the rapid release of pressure, uh, we uh, transfer the material into the second wash system um, where it will uh, be combined with water and very vigorously agitated to get those salts to go into solution. The material then goes out of the uh, pre-wash system into our dewatering system where it has multiple stages of dewatering, mechanical dewatering. It will then transfer out of the dewash system into the dryers where uh, the material will be um, dried to whatever the requirement is for the product that we're producing. If we're producing pellets, it's somewhere around 11, 12 percent. 
If we're producing engineered soil, it might be 15 to 30 percent, depending upon what we're what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and then uh, in this in this case, it's going to go to the product copper, uh, and then off to the pellet mill, where it will uh, um, be turned into pellets if that's what we're choosing. And then we're going to uh, cart it away. So you can see that the trucks have very easy access to the to the product. Um, and we'll put product storage if we need to. Uh, depends on the configuration and the application. Okay. So here is our uh, receipt hopper, the first, the first stop along the way. The material is loaded into an upper bin. Um, the upper bin holds enough material for one reactor. The lower bin holds <coughs> enough material for two reactors. And so what we're going to have is always one batch of material in residence in the uh, lower bin. When uh, it's time to um, push material in, the uh, lower bin, a conveyor, carries it up into the, uh, to the washing system, the RSMT, uh, where it will be uh, vigorously washed. That's, uh, if, if anybody, uh, I, I say tremel, but the right word is tremel. 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 Uh, from Hoboken, New Jersey, so we don't pronounce too many words correctly. Um, the thing uh, rotates around very vigorously like a washing machine. It's got a perforated screen so the water in the tank is able to get to the material. We're washing and washing and washing. That water is recycled. It uh, comes back down into a vibratory uh, separator, a big Suico. Uh, it vibrates and shakes the loose water off. The water goes into the uh, into the um, that tank, uh, and then um, uh, is pumped right back up again. And so we're using the water over and over. Now, obviously, water is going to carry with the material into uh, the reactor, so we're always going to have to be making up water. The way we make up the water, we have our own water tanks, and it's all recycled water. That water blows through a, a pipe in the center of the, the tremel uh, that really helps in the washing process. It's like a a uh, spray, a uh, high pressure spray that sprays the particles. Um, that water is making up the water that we lost, so this is really a balanced system. The uh, material then comes out of the RSMT uh, and is transported through a series of conveyors in this uh, elevator that looks something like a seahorse. Uh, coming down the nose of the seahorse, it goes onto a, a what's called a drag conveyor. And that material is, is uh, transported across and dot, dropped into the reactor that, that's being charged. There's a really large valve up here. You can see it, it's this, this gray deal. Um, heat closes off and seals the reactor when the reactor is full. The autoclave door is obviously closed on the bottom, or the material would just be falling through and it wouldn't be a particularly successful uh, batch. Um, we then introduce the steam, it explodes, goes through this pipe, here's that um, GEV, the gas expansion vessel, and then down off to the product hopper. Here's the conveyor, when, when it's time to empty it, we open the door, the material flies out of here onto the conveyor and off to that second wash. Uh, here's the second wash. The material comes in from a conveyor and drops into this big tank. Um, press the button, please. And then uh, water is introduced. And then the material, after it's had enough time in there, we're introducing some steam and some high pressure air to agitate it. After the material is thoroughly washed, it's transported up and out to the dewatering system. And there's the dewatering system. And you can see that uh, it's, it's fairly uh, congested in that container. Uh, Dan, who is the engineer who designed that container, is out of the automotive industry. And so if anybody has ever tried to service their own car, um, they understand that they, they, they're able to put uh, 10 pounds of uh, stuff in an 8-pound bag. Well, he, he managed to do that in that container. Uh, the material will come in uh, and go through these first two vibratory separators where the solids greater than one millimeter will fall <laughs> out into a big screw press and then down onto a conveyor and then uh, you know, the, the water coming out of that, which will have particles smaller than one millimeter, obviously, will go into this tank, and then that tank will pump back up to this second vibratory separator, 
where there's a screen in there at 100 microns. So material larger than 100 microns will fall out and uh, go down onto this conveyor, which will then carry it up to um, another press, and that material will join the press coming out of the, of the first separation. The water coming down um, and particles smaller than 100 microns will then go up into yet another vibratory separator. And you might want to ask why we're, we're so focused on this. Well, we, the material, those really small particles, are the most valuable particles. Um, the majority of those are lignin. And lignin is the most valuable part. It's the highest calorific value. But it's also the reason why we're able to produce pellets like this, because it's the, the lignin that binds the pellet together, makes it so hard, so shiny, and so durable. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But So the material is going to come out of here. Um, also go on that same um, conveyor, uh, through that same press, and then fall on the same belt off to the dryer. The water that comes out of here, out of this pressing process, uh, is now, um, this, this screen here is 38 microns. Uh, you're talking about the diameter of a hair at that point, so it's really, really small. Um, those small particles will come out through here, go through a series of inline strainers that take it down to less than 10 microns. Um, at that point in time, we found that there's virtually no solids left in the water at that point. At that point, it's just really water. In that water, you're going to have organic acids and you're going to have sugars that came out of the, out of the, uh, the process, and we will send those off to water treatment, that water with those dissolved uh, organic acids and sugars and then we'll reclaim those as well. And we'll use those as a fertilizer. Uh, we can um, do any number of different things with that, but those, those will be reclaimed as, as well. So we don't waste anything in the tree, not, not a bit. 99.5% um, recovery of solids um, that aren't the hemicellulose that went into solution, of course. So, and there we, you know, we save those, those solids and we, we reclaim those as well by introducing them into the, um, the, the big cyclone that uses the, the heat from the dryer. Um, and the material is off to, uh, to the dryers. So now we'll see the dryers. So here are the dryers. Um, we designed these dryers ourselves. Uh, these are um, fluidized bed dryers. We have, but they're conveyor and not vibratory. Uh, what we do is we uh, introduce the material through the top. Uh, first, well, of course, we have to have hot air to, to dry. So we introduce uh, flue gas from the boiler, plus the supplemental uh, gas from our auxiliary bo boiler, and some cold air to adjust the temperature to precisely what we want it to be. And that's a function of the material we're drying and, and the spec that we're trying to meet coming out of the dryers. Uh, we then introduce the material. The material goes through the dryer, first pass, uh, and you'll see down here, um, what we're doing is we're introducing hot gases from this, this dryer system, the, the burner system, into the conveyors. Uh, and, so, and that's going underneath the perforated sheet, so the hot gases are going through the perforated sheet and raising the material actually off of the, the bed. Uh, some material will fly out, um, and that's a normal thing. And it goes through these ducts here, and that'll go off to our, our product hopper where it'll be reclaimed uh, with a big cyclone. And that's where we introduce that, that spray of really fine material coming out of the, the, um, the inline strainers. Um, so out and off to the pellet mill. Uh, here is the product handling system. So here's the conveyor coming out of the dryer, dropping into our big bin down here. Here's uh, the material coming in in flying in fly form because it's been lifted off the bed and caught up in the airstream. It'll go through this giant cyclone uh, and fall down into the same product hopper. Uh, but a cyclone at best is, for this kind of material, is at best 80% efficient because the particles are really small. Uh, so we don't want to exhaust those into the atmosphere. We would fail miserably on the PM 2.5 or PM 10. Uh, standard and we surely don't want to do that and so what we do is we run that material through an electrostatic precipitator. Uh, now the cool thing is these particles are very highly charged even coming into uh, the, the, the electrostatic precipitator. It's just natural for those, those uh, 
those particles to pick up a charge. They're going to um, um, sc uh, scoot along and get caught up on plates that are inside of that electrostatic precipitator where they'll give up their charge and they'll cling to the plate and then uh, they'll fall out of there into the same bin. So all of those particles are being reclaimed. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to add, uh, and it depends very much on the application, but we're going to add a heat exchanger up here and we're going to try to reclaim some of those BTUs as well and we'll use that to preheat the, the water going into our boiler. Um, okay? Off to the pellet mill. Now it's truly off to the pellet mill. Um, here's the pellet mill. So we, we purchased a, a Bliss mill uh, and um, the, the mill actually will fit in the container. Uh, we actually have this style container where the doors open up and we could actually install the Bliss mill inside of the container. That mill out there will produce about six tons an hour of pellets. Uh, the material comes in here through a conditioner where if we need to, to moisten the material a little bit because it's too dry, we have the ability to introduce steam. The material falls down into the mill, the pellets come out. Uh, there it is proudly sitting outside, um, not in its container yet. Um, so we'll, we'll eventually get that in probably the first week of March. Okay? Dan? Uh, of course, we have to think in terms of water quality and, and, and more importantly, the recycling of water. Uh, obviously, we use a lot of water in our process and we don't want to be a, a, you know, constantly consuming water. So uh, we recycle all of our water. Um, so the water coming out of dewatering um, will, will go through our water treatment plant. And so we have um, three very large vessels, you'll see them outside, um, that are filled with activated carbon. And so we're going to run that water through the uh, activated carbon beds where the organics will be picked up. Uh, the organic acids and the sugars will be, will be caught up in the activated carbon. The water uh, coming out will come into this tank and we will measure the pH. And if necessary, we can adjust the pH by using uh, a little bit of ammonium hydroxide, a very small amount. Uh, to raise the pH and then back to our water tanks and so we're recycling the water and if we are processing material at 35 percent um, or higher moisture content we're essentially water um, neutral or even water accretive which is to say we're not going to be pulling water the only time we'll pull water is when we need to uh, discharge water because the you know the salts get a little high and it's time to discharge water, but that water will meet surface water discharge requirements. Um, the system is spec for that. So we won't discharge any water that isn't uh, um, within the standards. Keep looking to you because I, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, so he's DEQ. So, um, so anyway, uh, the water uh, will come out. These two tanks here, uh, we affectionately call them Monday, Tuesday. Um, they're settling tanks, and so we'll fill this tank on Monday and this tank on Tuesday, and while this one is filling, this one is settled, and we'll pull the solids out, and we'll pull the solids out that settle on the bottom. Those are sub-38 micron particles, and we'll send them into the cyclone of the dryer to reclaim those as well. Um, and then on the Wednesday, we'll do this guy, and we'll be filling him and back and forth. So he's also named Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. Um, so that's our water treatment strategy. Uh, where we are uh, with the plant, um, we are right now in our startup, startup and testing program. Uh, understand that this is serial number one at this scale. And, uh, you know, the best laid plans, we would like to be running uh, full bore, but we're still in our startup and test plan. Um, so far, we have commissioned uh, the front end of our system, and so that's what you'll see today. There are uh, several parts to that. that. That's everything up to and including the, the reactors. Uh, so what we can do now is we can fill the reactors. Um, walk, well, actually, we can fill the receipt hopper. We can wash the material. We can convey the material into the reactors. We can beneficiate the material. Uh, and let it fall down onto the reclaimed conveyor and then we can cart it out. Now that's not a bad thing for us. Commercially that's fine because right now we're processing material for Young Living Farms 
and we're making soil amendment. And so it doesn't need to go through that second wash uh, and drying process. Um, it'll be dewatered to the spec that they'll give us. It'll be uh, plenty clean, uh, but more importantly, it'll, it'll be uh, um, a great uh, um, carbon base for their, um, for their soil, for their, for their planting. Um, so we're going to run uh, at least uh, a few thousand tons for them while we're commissioning uh, the second uh, part of our plant, which is the, uh, the post wash, the dewatering, and the drying systems. And so we are busily um, uh, completing those systems and commissioning them. And they'll be uh, running by February 16th. So by then we will have produced at least a, a few tons for Young Living Farms, and we will be uh, dewatering and, and drying material to make uh, pellets for Rocky Mountain Power for their test at uh, the Hunter plant, uh, part of the STEP program. Um, by uh, phase three, we'll have the, uh, the pellet mill and the product handling systems installed by the end of February. And so we should be making our own pellets. Uh, our friends at Woodscape, I saw one of them walk in. There's, there's a couple of friends from Woodscape. Uh, they have been very gracious and uh, they have been pelleting for us. Um, these pellets that are on the table were made uh, with our material in their, uh, their system. And uh, so you'll see that uh, um, you know, we, we have the ability to, to produce pellets and, until we get our own pellet mill commissioned. And they're going to help us, I am sure, with that process because uh, they're the pellet experts. Um, the, the last phase uh, of our uh, system uh, testing and startup and testing is the, uh, the completion of the integration and final automation. Uh, we really can't complete the final automation until we have actually run the system so we know exactly what it is um, that has to be, um, you know, the, the speeds for the motors and, and all of those types of things. So we're, we're doing that in parallel. We're actually already obviously well in the way of uh, system integration and, and uh, final automation, but that will be finished uh, on or before March 9th, at which point we will transition the plant over to the operations department. And I don't see uh, Jason here, but uh, our operations manager is, I guess, outside. All right, so um, what I'm also gonna do right now is I'm gonna ask Drew to tell you a little bit about our product. Um, Drew is our chief scientist and he'll explain why these pellets are so hard and so shiny and why, uh, why we're different than everyone else. So, Drew, would you give a few minutes? Phil alluded to um, biomass contains mostly three compounds, yeah. uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And our process removes some, some of the hemicellulose and therefore enriches the lignin that's left over. And lignin is a polymer, it's a phenolic polymer. And when the powder gets run through the press, the press um, packs uh, mechanical energy to it and heats it up. And heats it up so that the phenolic polymer melts. And then it, after it comes out of the press, it re-solidifies and it makes a nice shiny black polymer. I think that's what Phil was. Yeah, that's really what I really wanted to, to speak to. The, 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 uh, the shiny surface is, is more than uh, there for just good looks, uh, although they really do look good, um, but uh, they look like licorice. Uh, the, the reason why we're really pleased with that is it makes the pellet hydrophobic. Um, now, there's a difference between hydrophobic and waterproof. Uh, hydrophobic means that the pellet will, um, uh, Dan is going to do the demonstration. Uh, hydrophobic means that the, the pellet will resist water. Technically it means it has a phobia for water, and so it doesn't like water. It won't last, yeah, that was a, that was a very, a very staged thing. Yeah, yeah. So you know it's not and like. It's not acid in one and water in another. <laughs> Uh, so, um, it means that it's hydrophobic. So what does that mean? That means that we can leave those pellets out in the environment and they will not absorb water. Um, and they will 
maintain an equilibrium moisture content of three and a half percent. What that means is that they will um, be extremely uh, easy to handle. You don't have to put them in storage facilities. You don't have to worry about um, them picking up moisture and falling out of spec. They'll last for um, as long as you need them to last outside in the weather. Other pellets need to be stored inside. Now, Zilka and Arbor Flame, they make a pellet that's also hydrophobic, um, but again, they don't uh, um, have the, the, the same properties as our pellets. Our pellets are, are quite, uh, um, quite um, durable and, and uh, you know, obviously significantly cleaner. The um, other aspect of those pellets that I think is important is that uh, they do not make dust. They simply will not make dust. Um, you can handle them as much as you want. You might fracture the pellets if you're rough with them, if you're using a bucket loader or an auger, but they simply will not go back to dust. And so that's a very important consideration um, for several reasons. One is you obviously lose that dust in transport, and so that's money that's lost. The other important thing is that pellets are, are potentially explosive hazards uh, with all that dust. Well, we don't make dust. Um, those pellets simply cannot dust. The phenols, the, the uh, lignin is holding literally every single microparticle together. And so, I'm sorry? Except in a ball mill. Except in a ball mill. Then they make dust. Uh, they make really great dust at that point. They also mill very well. Uh, we've done a mill test with uh, um, uh, the University of Utah, and we've run that material through the mill, and we have pulverized it down to uh, sub-200 mesh, which is less than 79 microns, which is typically the standard for a coal plant, um, and it milled just wonderfully. And of course, it didn't ignite in the, uh, the test mill, or, or we probably wouldn't be here talking about it. Um, so you can see our, our, here's our white pellets. And uh, it's something like your oatmeal in the morning. Um, you can see that they've already disintegrated. And here are our pellets. I'm making a mess, but the sound effect is worth it. Um, you can see that they're quite intact. Um, nothing coming off. Um, and they'll, they'll stay like that. Now, like I said, they're not waterproof. And water is a very powerful solvent, and so in a couple of hours, they'll start to degrade. But we typically don't store our pellets in lakes. I think that's reasonable. Um, so uh, we're not likely to, uh, to have any loss um, by leaving them out in the humidity. But you can see that these are gone now. They're right back to being sawdust. So um, hang out by me. The material over there is uh, largely uh, or entirely uh, taken from the mountains in Utah. Uh, it is a combination of sawmill residue, but it's also uh, ground up um, uh, forest culling. And so uh, that material is, is uh, mostly, uh, well, I shouldn't say mostly, probably about 70% softwood and about 30% hardwood, um, all different quality. Uh, you know, the salt mill material is probably pretty clean, but the, certainly the, uh, the stuff that was culled out of the forest is pretty dirty. Uh, but we're agnostic to the feedstock, and dirt doesn't bother us because we're going to get it out anyway. We like dirt because it makes the material uh, affordable. So the material will be uh, carted off, and so the material will be loaded into our receipt hopper, first into the upper bin, and there are doors that open and close. Um, after we've filled the receipt hopper, we shut the doors so that it becomes, and these doors would normally be closed. So we contain the steam that comes out of the reactor so that we're preheating the material and we're reclaiming the water. A significant amount of that steam is gonna condense uh, and we'll keep the water, it'll just be moistening the material. Given that we're gonna put it in a bath a few minutes later, it doesn't really hurt to reclaim the water, and that's that much less water we need to replace. Uh, so it'll fall into this bin. When it's time to uh, load one of the reactors, that conveyor will start, and it'll transport it up.
will go up this conveyor and it'll go into that pre-wash system and that is a uh, giant washing machine. So it's just tumbling the material around in a bath of water. Water is spraying from the front down onto the material to wash the material also. So it's getting a thorough bath. So the, uh, the water is going to come down out of the, the big washing machine, the Tremel, and it'll go through that vibratory separator and it'll shake off the loose water. The loose water will be now uh, pretty clear and it'll fall into this tank where it'll be pumped right back up to the, uh, to the washing machine, to the R, what we call the RSMT, it'll cycle. It's paying attention to the salt content in the water. And at some point in time, it'll reject that water uh, through this uh, two-way valve and that water will go back to our water treatment plant. For people who like big machines, we call this our machine room. Here is our uh, hydraulic system. And so this is what's uh, powering the doors. Um, it's made by Spencer Fluid Power, a, a Utah company, uh, one, of our, one of our key vendors. Here is our uh, water system. We pump out of these two tanks. Each one of them holds 21,000 gallons of water. It's the recycled water. The water is, is pulled out of here and, and sent off to the plant. Um, we have a, a giant compressor back there. Uh, we frequently call it the mother of all compressors. It is uh, um, 400 CFM at uh, 175 PSI, so it's a massive, massive amount of air. And uh, that's what we use for agitating our tanks. Here is our control room, and we're still populating it with controls. Uh, that's the final phase four of our, uh, they're all built and they're gonna be installed uh, within the next week. So uh, that will, uh, um, you know, be this, the control center. And so we'll have one operator in there uh, controlling the entire plant. And we'll have another operator whose job is to rove, to check the systems, to, to you know, do the sampling, all of the, the usual things. Um, uh, well, it'll take two to run the plant. And then we'll have one guy on the front end and one guy on the back end. So we'll run about four people per shift. And we're going to run uh, four shifts a week. And then what we'll do is we will um, uh, have one guy during uh, the day shift to do maintenance, the preventive maintenance guy. We talked about uh, the different systems We talked about the different systems in the plant. Uh, the dryer is up there. Uh, water treatment is down there. Um, that's an extension of the dryer. That's where the big burner is, the, the plenum that takes the flue gas from the boiler, as well as the supplemental uh, burner. Uh, that's the dryer up there. And um, if we come around this way, so there are the dryers. Uh, you can see that there's two. One that uh, receives the material and drops it down. And then there's a conveyor that will be installed after today that will run that material over to our product copper. And the uh, gases that are coming out of there, the hot gases with the fly particles, are going to go into that cyclone up there and fall down into the product copper, as well as the particles that are going to be picked up by the uh, electrostatic precipitator. My name is Jeff Larson, Senior Vice President of uh, Strategic Planning for Rocky Mountain Power uh, Pacific Corp. And in 2016, the company uh, worked with stakeholders and passed legislation in Utah known as the Sustainable Transportation and Energy Plan Act. That allowed us to have uh, some limited funding for innovative technologies and it covers a broad spectrum of uh, electric vehicles, uh, storage batteries, and innovative technologies at our power plants, looking at clean coal solutions. 
one of the opportunities we opportunities that we looked at to pursue was biomass uh, test burns and introducing that into our fuel stream into our power plants. And uh, so what we're doing, and we're very happy to be here looking at opportunities of taking Utah material. Uh, here we've got uh, some waste product out of Utah that we're going to turn into uh, a biomass material, pelletize it, and put it through a test burn at our Hunter power plant. And so we're uh, interested to see the results of that, uh, how it handles through the coal mills, and the properties of uh, introducing biomass into a, a coal test burn cycle. Ultimately, the, uh, the end product here, um, turning the, the sawdust and wood material into pelletized uh, product to, to mix with the coal stream. So Basically man-made coal. Man-made coal. Um, so inter interested to see um, how it burns, how it mills, how it comes through uh, the cycle. Ultimately, uh, hopeful that it opens up some opportunities for, for biomass here in Utah and biomass opportunities that would provide uh, our customers benefits at our coal plants, being able to leverage those, those units uh, in terms of uh, their life cycle and, and uh, cost for customers. Uh, interested to see ultimately how it performs as a, a test product. Yeah, that's what uh, hopefully we, we see a, a test burn will, will deliver is what does it do in terms of the cost profile, what does it do in terms of emission profile and output. Uh, yet to be seen, but uh, that's why we're, we're doing the pilot test and why we wanted to look at an innovative technology to see, in fact, are there benefits for customers, are there benefits for environmental uh, emission profiles and, and see you know what the opportunities are there. So my name is Mark Harris. I'm the Vice President of Global Farming for Young Living and uh, I've gotten uh, to work with uh, Active Energy Group for about two and a half years trying to develop uh, a, a product for our waste stream. So during our normal farming operations and ag operations we harvest different plant materials, and in this case in Utah, it's juniper, and we extract the oil out of the juniper. And what's left over is we have these juniper chips. And they would make great compost if we could wait about 30 or 40 years, uh, but the problem is they break down so slowly. So working with Active Energy Group, we've come up with a way of taking our juniper chips and processing them into an engineered soil, a peat, and we can engineer it individually for each different farm for specific crop and plant needs. So we can change either the bios, uh, the microbes in it, or the fertilizer base in it to, to make this soil amendment. And what it does is it, it's part of our seed to seal process. It lets us harvest from the ground, we extract the oils, and then we take this waste product, basically, and then we re-engineer it to put it back into the ground for further uh, you know, development of our farms. It, it, it can be a piece of moss replacement, but it's actually more. It's a soil amendment for us. So we could take this and engineer it specifically for our different farms, for different locations. Because each farm has different soil contents, whether it's silt or loam, and this helps us adjust all those different parameters. And also, each plant has specific parameters. So some of the plants maybe more nitrogen or less nitrogen or these other diversified uh, compounds that we put into it. So we can really um, make each one of these uh, species of plant give them the best material instead of just going to uh, one of these different uh, fertilizer companies and just getting a generic fertilizer that is kind of broad base. We can really uh, fine tune basically this soil amendment per each one of our fields. This is going to be incorporated in not only in our farm in Mona, but I can see this being incorporated in our farms up in Idaho, the two farms we have up there in Highlands and St. Mary's, and even up in uh, British Columbia. We have uh, another tree farm up there, and uh, this technology will really help us, uh, and it gives us a second revenue stream almost, where we can actually take uh, a waste product that and, and use this internally in our own operations. Normally, it, it's used uh, you know, commercially as mulch, uh, but it's, it's always um, you know, a waste because it's much more than mulch for decorative purposes. Right. I mean, let's take this and, and reuse it 
for us to cultivate more of our plants. It, it, it's a great win-win because we, we're, you know, and also it's environmentally friendly. I mean, we're taking something that would naturally take years and years to break down. We're breaking it down right away and then we're putting it right back into the ground. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Brian Cottom. I'm the director of the Utah Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands, as well as the state forester. We're separate from the U.S. Forest Service. We're the state agency that has forest management responsibility here. One of the interesting things about our agency is we don't actually have any state forest land that we manage, but we're, we're interested and work with all forest landowners, federal and private, to make sure that we can have active forest management and, and healthy forests. Our role, our relationship with industry of all sort is we know as a state agency, as a government agency, we can't meet the needs that we have in the forest. Healthy forest, healthy watersheds, wildfire risk reduction. We can't do that on our own. That requires industry. That requires folks like you all, others that are coming back into the woods and working in the woods in Utah. Our role is to support them, help them get the raw materials, help them make the right contacts, help them work with the U.S. Forest Service who controls so much of the land, because you guys are the ones that are doing the work on the ground. Yeah, the, the role in the long term for managing all of our forest lands in Utah, we have to work together. In Utah, the vast majority of the forest and woodlands, they're owned by the federal government, by the U.S. Forest Service. We, my agency, my staff, understands the rules and regulations that they have. We can often be the bridge between the landowner, private or federal, to industry. That's a role that we, that, that we can play, that we will continue to play, and help to make sure that you all can successfully get into the woods, whatever the agency, whatever the ownership, and do the kind of the forest management work that we all want done. Honestly, the biggest hurdle that we have in Utah is that the, the vast majority of forest and woodland is owned by the federal government, whether it's the U.S. Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management. They have rules and regulations that they have to follow. And so we have to figure out those ways that we can work with them in order to allow the forest and the woodworkers in there to do that active forest management that we all want, get the raw material, the product to businesses like yours that can use it, that can make something value added out of it. That's honestly the biggest challenge we have and it's been the biggest challenge for a few decades now. Yeah, when, when the resource isn't managed as, as well as it should be, this past year we had the largest and most, well it was the fourth largest by acreage and the most expensive state managed fire in the history of Utah. The Bryan Head Fire down on the Dixie National Forest. Um, it was a catastrophic fire and it's cost the citizens of this, of this state an immense amount of money. Those kind of things, fires are going to happen. They don't have to be as bad as the Bryan Head Fire was. The more active management that we do, we talk about increasing the pace and the scale of forest management, the better off we can be when it comes to wildfire risk reduction and just healthy ecosystems generally. This, this stuff, traditionally, this would have not much value, but what's outstanding about the work that you all are doing and some of the other companies that are here in the state, you guys are finding value for something that maybe in the past has been worthless. That can help us as a government agency continue to pay for the work possibly that needs to get done on the ground or change the economics in a way that we can try to continue to get more acreage uh, treated out there.